the gender studies lectures have been designed to showcase the work that faculty from across campus are doing in the areas of gender studies, which is quite a diverse field. And so we've heard from the theater department, from um, sociology, from the Gady Institute and the historians, um, and tonight from Sherry Larson Heckley of the English department. Sherry's been teaching on women writers, gender concerns in English literature, and the intersections of gender and race and um, global movement here at Westmont since 1997. She's also published widely in these areas, particularly on issues of gender and religion and Victorian women novelists for our journals and for essay collections. And of course, as I'm sure many of you know, she has traveled widely herself, leading Westmont students through England, the United Kingdom, um, Northern Europe, um, working on reading women novelists and traveling in the places that they have been. Um, she's also traveled to Iowa, the exotic <laughs> realm, where she had a national endowment for the humanities grant last summer. Also last summer, she was part of a faculty group who did a border immersion experience in Arizona. And she brings together her interests in immigration and border crossings in our own world with her interest in women writers um, and their movements around the Victorian world across Europe tonight in her lecture. Redundant Women and Expatriates, Victorian Women Writers Abroad, and the Language of Global Sojourning. Please join me in welcoming Sherry. Thank you all really for being here on a rainy Tuesday night after spring break. Um, I appreciate it. Um, when I first proposed the sabbatical project, this paper begins, I was thinking primarily of what's been called the Syrian refugee crisis and the United States border debates. Um, but in the intervening months, the conversation has intensified in ways that not even I imagined. Um, I originally planned a project on the three best remembered Victorian women writers. That's Charlotte Bronte, George Eliot, who was born Mary Ann Evans um, and adopted the name George Eliot um, to use as a novelist. Um, and the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who I'm going to, following critical tradition, probably end up referring to as EBB at several points tonight. That's who I mean. This is actually the term for her that gets used in scholarly articles, and I've tried to write it out, um, but just, real, just caught myself twice tonight in places in this paper where I've used the, her initials, so forgive me if I lapse back into that. Um, tonight's the first public airing for these thoughts on how um, the way we use terms for Victorian women writers might actually unwittingly be inflecting our policy and our thinking about policy on contemporary immigration issues. So your questions, your criticisms, um, your thoughts are going to be incredibly welcome. I'm only giving an outline of an argument tonight, omitting most close reading, a whole lot of context, and all theory. So um, we can talk about any of those details if you want to in Q&A as well. Okay. But I think it's a fair question to ask why start talking about contemporary geopolitical issues at all with three 19th century women who wrote fiction. Frankly, imaginative literature is what I do in this Christian liberal arts context. And I can think of few better ways to use the resources of a Christian liberal arts education right now. Um, I'll have more to say about that use of resources in my final comments. Climate change would be the other issue that I think we should muster the resources of a Christian liberal arts education for. I'm not going to say anything about climate change, but you can hear a lot about it this weekend at the conversation on the liberal arts. Um, liberal arts for a fragile planet. I would encourage you to go to the Gady Institute site and look for that. Okay? These eminent writers all lived um, thinking very much about social issues around them, though not about climate change. Um, they got, climate change was a thing in the 19th century, by the way, but um, they got called expatriates in their lives very often. And even while the conditions of their lives abroad often parallel the situations of less fortunate global travelers who we're seeing in the news today, that term stuck for them. So I want to look at that term expatriate and its peculiar uses and how I think it lies at the root of my project. And that'll be a little bit, that'll be much of what I talk about today. The idea of a person leaving the country of their birth, occasionally fleeing that country to avoid violence, occasionally motivated by political oppression, occasionally driven by poverty or the hunger of her family, hardly ever fosters the desire for imitation. 
Um, I purposely use the pronoun her, though journalistic coverage of migrants today frequently focuses on laborers coming across the southern border or on single men crossing the Mediterranean for Europe. Gender in these cases seems to aggravate their threat, even though not all travelers from the Middle East or from Central America are masculine, and certainly not all of the men who are traveling are threatening. Um, and many women are actually fleeing specifically gendered persecution. Femininity, as I'll show, prompted my three women writers to leave home. And gender was equally a part of public concerns in their travels. Regardless of gender, we may sympathize with refugees, and I hope at Westmont we do. We may admire their bravery and their persistence under trauma, even of those of us who are resistant to more porous borders. We may be moved to help refugees. We might even notice the structures that have contributed to their trauma and begin engaging to mitigate those structural injustices. So we may invest, invest considerable energy in thinking about migrants. Um, still, I think it's safe to say that very few of us hopes to find ourselves in the position of a migrant or a refugee that we see in the news. Barrett Browning's, Bronting's, Elliot's lives and work remind us that the language we use for global travelers and the way we imagine them matters materially. While those of us with secure residency may not envy any of the travelers we see in the news today, um, the crucial international legal privileges of refugee over migrant are earnestly sought by millions of people around the world. Refugee law came into existence after the Victorian era, so after the women who I work on, um, in the wake of World War I um, and then World War II and was first codified in 1951 at the convention relating to the status of refugees. Later clarifications of that convention defined a refugee as a person whom, quote, and here you're going to hear masculine pronouns because I'm quoting refugee law, owing to external aggression, occupation, foreign domination, or events seriously disturbing public order in either part or the whole of his country of origin or nationality, is compelled to leave his place of habitual residence in order to seek refuge in another place outside his country of origin or nationality. That definition is still narrow and it would exclude many people who leave their homes for security reasons. Though asylum law, or the law that grants someone refugee status, varies from nation to nation, to gain refugee status, a person must apply for asylum in the country of their arrival, and only after often extensive processes of vetting and legal appearances, a designation of refugee status gains a person legal protections. Those legal protections include the right not to be forcibly returned to their, his or her home country, as well as rights to education, rights to um, access to the local justice system, to work, and to live with security. The burden of proving the need for refugee status is always on the asylum seeker. We've watched the results of this complicated process play out as European asylum seekers have found themselves stranded on the Mediterranean coast, unable to get refugee status and be called migrants, and also on our own southern borders. I'm surprised repeatedly at how few Californians know that we have Central Americans coming north fleeing violence and applying for refugee status um, on the Arizona-California-Texas borders. So while refugee status might be enviable to some immigrants for the slight security that it grants them, it's still not an enviable position for those of us who have secure homes. I'm thinking about envy tonight because I want to consider what it means that some people often do aspire a kind of envy or at least a desire in groups of of us who have secure homes to consider living abroad. And here I think the lives of these three women help, writers are particularly helpful. Maybe we don't want to permanently relocate, but my experience leading off-campus programs is one of the things that tells me that it's safe to say many of us still find appeal in leading a life somewhere other than where we were born in the US, if we were born in the US, and to spend extended periods of time living in some other region of the world. In the 19th century, George Eliot spent several months at a time on more than one occasion on the continent, mourning the loss of her father, researching her novels, improving her foreign language skills, and in the period I'll focus on this evening, beginning a career as a novelist and stabilizing her extra-legal relationship with George Henry Lewes. Charlotte Bronte, likewise, moved to Brussels to improve her French and to develop other skills necessary to open a girls' school with her sisters. Elizabeth Barrett Browning eloped with Robert Browning and settled in Florence where her health improved in a warmer climate and where they could afford the comfortable household that eluded them in London after her father disinherited her for marrying. All three of these women, that's to say, left home for economic reasons, with their limited financial condi conditions aggravated by their femininity. In my entire career as a Victorianist, 
which I realized as I was writing this, is longer than some of you are old. So I'm just saying, I get to say in my entire career, and that has a certain kind of rhetorical weight, um, including some time invested in writing specifically on Elliot and Barrett Browning, I've never heard these women referred to as migrants. In literary scholarship and elsewhere, the term we use for them is consistently expatriates. Um, Though we often ignore the term in conversation about global, global movement, I think we need to put it alongside emigrant, refugee, migrant, and immigrant to more fully consider the dynamics of global population and movement. Today, when most of us hear the term expatriate, or its hip short form, expat, um, we have positive responses often. Expatriates, after all, are the travelers who know a destination away from their home well enough to function as a resident while enjoying some of the novelty of the visitor. Migrants and refugees often inspire our sympathy. The cosmopolitan life of an expatriate might inspire envy if one's inclined to like adventure. The history of the term, though, reminds us to look at how these categories should inform each other. The Oxford English Dictionary tells us that expatriate came into usage in the early 19th century. So it was new, and unlike the definition of refugee, available for Barrett Browning, for Bronte, and for Eliot. Originally, its connotations were not entirely positive. In the 19th century, expatriate was used as a verb, meaning to banish or to send someone away from their home country. In the 1830s, to expatriate someone was to force them into the position of an alien or to make them a refugee, often from revolutionary turmoil under rising democracies in France or in Italy or in what was then Prussia or in what we now call Eastern Europe. The OED's first legal use of the term is from much later, in 1889, and in that instance, the common from the common international law text, people are choosing to expatriate themselves, to renounce their own citizenship rather than have it taken from them. By 1902, though, when the American novelist Lillian Bell wrote about wealthy Americans who lived in Paris, quote, simply because life in the French capital suited their taste, um, she titled her novel The Expatriates. And at this point, I think we have the term as we very often use it. By the early 20th century, the connotations of choosing a comfortable life in a desirable foreign locale had become the common situation described by the term expatriate. All late 20th century examples of the OED stress this element of choice and often of cultural privilege. Most pointedly, in an illustration from The Economist in 1961, what we read, in Dar es Salaam, all the talk is about, quote, expatriates, the technical names for the Europeans who run the country alongside or behind the African ministers. This quotation reflects the frequent connotations of Europeans and Americans in post-colonial settings, behind government ministers in southern hemispheres, and enjoying a power through outmoded colonial habits, often without local accountability, or at least without visibility of their accountability. When literary scholars today write about 19th century expatriates, we usually imagine them with some of the gloss of Bell's Parisian inhabitants still clinging to their biographies and to the criticism of their work about women living abroad. But there's still too little attention to how English colonial ambition or military power in the 19th century might shape their privileges. The three texts we're talking about tonight fall between the clusters of dates in the OED. So between the earliest ones in the 19th century that are negative and then the later 19th century and 21st century that are more positive. In the decades between the term being taken to mean exile and the time it came to have a cosmopolitan flair, all, below, all before a bureaucratized system of international visas, excuse me, Barrett Browning wrote her poem Aurora Lee, Bronte wrote Villette, and George Eliot wrote Daniel Deronda. These mid-Victorian texts text can tell us all something about how international travel might be imagined in a window of transition from relatively negative uses of the term to the more positive connotation it enjoys today. Note that I did not call the mid-19th century a simpler time. The Victorians had plenty of nationalist anxieties and racist phobias, but the connotation for the term shifted in a window not locked into our categories for thinking about travelers. These women's lives abroad all seem in some way, as I said, to fit the patterns current of current discourse um, on, on, I'm sorry, on economic migrants. In their new locations, each needed remunerative work that they struggled to find at home. They each wanted some more flexible definition of femininity than middle class England offered them. And since gender is a protected category in international law, we can say they had political motivations for traveling. Additionally, they each confronted but eventually thrived intellectually and creatively under cultural challenges of their new communities. 
whether these challenges were linguistic, religious, or imaginative. It's also arguably the case, though I won't be able to talk about this much, that those challenges put cultural pressures on local people they coexisted with. These women writers, in other words, challenge us to consider whether our choice of expatriate over migrant may not be motivated as much by our own post-colonial inheritance of the idea of a northern hemisphere cultural superiority. These three women in their literature, in short, give us occasion to reflect on whether language for global travel grows as much from economic principles or national sovereignty in the US as it does from complexities of racism or from a sense of cultural supremacy of the global north. While we might question the possible application of migrant over expatriate for these women, Victorian England coined an even less, I think, attractive concept than ours for many of them. In 1862, W.R. Gregg popularized the decidedly unflattering term redundant women to approach what he saw as a problem of an excess of single women in the British Isles. Before I get into details of Greg's argument, I'll just pause here for a minute and let you all consider whether you would rather be expatriates or redundant people. <laughs> okay. Thought so. Greg wrote in an effort to respond to growing concern about female unemployment in Great Britain at mid-century. From Greg's perspective, attempts to find women employment were only palliative or treating the symptoms and would never solve a problem caused by what he saw as an aberration of natural law. The aberration that Greg sees is an unnatural balance between the sexes in Great Britain. There are simply too many women for all of them to be married. So some of them will have to be shipped out. <laughs> Unless these women were sent abroad to reach a more natural balance of the genders within Britain, and he's completely serious. This is a completely straightforward argument. Greg sees an escalation of the kinds of social problems one might expect when the natural order is disturbed. Okay. In his pamphlet then, Greg devotes little more than 20 pages a little more than 20 pages to charts and to arguments intended to demonstrate that the natural balance between the sexes is so egregiously skewed in the British Isles that the only reasonable solution is to muster all of the resources needed to send shiploads of women to far regions of the globe um, with the unfounded hope that they will meet men there willing to marry him, them and whom they are willing to marry. Only after making this extravagant argument does he turn to a paragraph, one paragraph, on the sexual double standard of the mid-19th century. The sexual double standard meaning men pay very little social cost for sex outside of marriage and women can pay fatal consequences for that in the 19th century. As Greg puts it, after apologizing for plain speech, so many women are single because so many men are profligate. For male promiscuity, Greg has no charts to lead him to social reform. He simply concludes, quote, that thousands of men find it perfectly feasible to combine all the freedom, luxury, and self-indulgence of a bachelor's career with the pleasures of female society and the enjoyments they seek there. As Barrett Browning, Bronte, and Eliot all recount in their fiction, Victorian men enjoyed nearly unregulated sexual liberty, and Victorian women often paid the price for that male sexual freedom in being outcast for participating as partners or being isolated and called redundant for refusing to. Greg finds no feasible response to the social problem of unrestrained male sexual liberty in the 19th century. For Greg then, mass immigration of women is a simpler solution than a cultural education campaign to slow rates of male promiscuity. He's earnestly convinced that natural law renders this global trafficking of women the only solution to restore social equity as he understands it. From our historical distance, Greg's argument seems willfully misguided, but his earnestness in his claims for the common ground of Britain might help us see the ways our own conversations about global migration have been guided by fog lenses about relations between people. And Greg wasn't the only person who took this approach. There were entire societies for female immigration intending to take boats of women to Australia, to the United States, to New Zealand, where people would marry them. Um, Certainly, Bronte, Barrett, Browning, and Eliot all imagined fiction that allowed alternate solutions to the problem that Greg sees. Barrett Browning called her long text a verse novel. Aurora Lee's a hybrid, written in eight books of blank verse with a lot of the content that novels actually take on. The plot moves back and forth from Florence, where Barrett Browning died, to England, where she was born. The story of her eponymous heroine was one that she wrote to engage boldly with several heated issues around women's rights in the 1850s. The poem also engages with migration. Aurora's father's early death in Italy, after her mother dies in childbirth, sends the child Aurora to England, where she has never lived, to be cared for by her rather dauntingly proper English aunt. <laughs> 
Aurora begins her life as the closest example of a migrant heroine we might ever find in Victorian literature. She's not much wanted, she's unable to speak the language well, and she's strange to everyone who meets her. She's also lonely at the end of her long journey. When she arrives in the English countryside, her aunt's first efforts are to anglicize her, forcing her to assimilate by taming her curly Italian hair into proper English braids and purging her language of any of its Italian accents. She also meets and falls in love with her cousin Romney, and it's not atypical in the 19th century for cousins to fall in love. That's just one little bit of clarification. Though Barrett Browning does not identify W.R. Gregg as an influence on her poem, Romney functions, functions as a bachelor in a marriage market that's so tight he grapples with three potential brides. So there are two women Gregg might call redundant. Those, that set of three women include Aurora, and her nemesis, the aristocratic and conniving Lady Baltimore, and the woman Aurora befriends after Lady Baltimore betrays, betrays them both, a seamstress named Marion Earle. Barrett Browning's strong female characters and her known engagement with women's issues make it fair to assume that even if she weren't challenging Greg's language, she was challenging premises of social thinkers like him. The evil Lady Waldemar never emigrates, and she's evil, so I'm not going to say much about her. Um, <laughs> but Aurora and Marion have quite different, very full immigration stories. The title character's story is simplest, so I'll start with her. Aurora's cousin, the philanthropist Romney, is fond enough of her to propose, but her femininity makes it impossible for, her to imagine, for him to imagine her sustaining a poetic vacation when she's destined to be someone's helpmate. Depressed by her inability to make a life in England, where she's been lonely for most of it anyway, except when Romney talks to her, she leaves for Italy, which she can afford, while working on her literary art. Just a few weeks before her departure, recognizing that she will never marry him, Romney develops a plan to collapse class barriers by marrying the seamstress Marion Earl and, and building a cross-class community on his estate. The jealous Lady Valdemar, however, stops that marriage by selling Marion to a trafficker. This kidnapper carries Marion across the English Channel and rapes her on board the ship. He then abandons her in Paris. And in one of the coincidences that abound in realist fiction, Aurora runs into Marion and her newborn child in a Paris flower market while she's wandering the streets of the city trying to find a solution to heartbreak over Romney. I don't think Paris is a good city to wander alone trying to get over heartbreak. <laughs> Aurora convinces Marion to bring her child to Florence, where the bride Romney rejects and the bride who runs away from him disprove Greg's notion of redundant femininity by setting up an all-female household, caring for Marion's child together, and living on Aurora's literary earnings in an affordable Italian city. As Aurora assures Marion, quote, henceforth you and I, being still together, will not miss a friend, nor he, the baby, a father, since two mothers shall make that up to him. Their household becomes too strange, their all-female household doesn't become too strange to narrate until Romney unexpectedly pays them a visit. First, Marion seems to simply disappear from the text at this point. We don't see him again. She shows Romney and tells Aurora that he's here, and then she's gone. No one ever talks about her anymore. Um, and it's as if Barrett Browning can imagine a life for two women together, but not for integrating Marion's child into any domestic setting that would include a male figure, even one as philanthropically minded as Romney. Not even Barrett Browning's narrative um, can entirely accommodate that. The final pages of the narrative reveal that Romney's a chastened self, blinded by a house fa fire started when working class residents he brings to his estate riot and set the house on fire. Those of you who have read Jane Eyre, this might sound familiar. In fact, people said to Barrett Browning, you can't do that. Everyone will think you plagiarized, and she did it anyway. So um, when all that he has built literally comes crashing down around him, Romney enjoys a corrected internal vision of the value of Aurora's poetic vocation, vocation and realizes that they should be married and support each other in their work. In spite of this renewed vision of the man she loves, Aurora can't narrate their dual laboring partnership in any realistic sense. Instead, she imagines her life together with the biblical language of the book of Revelation as the mystically jeweled city of New Jerusalem, located just beyond the horizon in the Italian countryside. Barrett Browning then relies on a kind of Christian mysticism to locate the female migrant in a thriving community. Her work, in other words, sheds light on the three women who are all attached to Romney and turns to scriptural tropes to suggest multiple critiques of Greg's remedies for redundant women through migration. Charlotte Bronte takes a different approach. 
Her novel of a poor Englishwoman, Lucy Snow, living and teaching in the fictional city of Vallette, is more focused on its alter in its alternative vision. Bronte's experience abroad is certainly relevant to any reading of Vallette, a novel critical tradition has recognized as her most autobiographical. Famously, Charlotte is the longest surviving of six siblings, with two sisters who lived just long enough to be Charlotte's authorial companions. The three are notoriously remembered as homebodies who spend most of their lives in the parsonage of their broad church Anglican preacher father in Northern Haworth. Their letters document the economic anxiety they suffered and how that matches the kind Greg so unceremoniously laments, though none of them ever self-identified as redundant in anywhere that I can find. Prompted by that economic anxiety to try to overcome her social anxiety, Charlotte spent two years far from home in Brussels, studying to attain the skills that she and her sister Emily hoped to make it possible for them to return to Haworth forever, providing themselves with a living by running a girls' school from the parsonage. Charlotte stayed nearly two years longer than Emily at Pensanot Hager, where she developed an intense emotional attachment to her teacher, Constantine Hager, a relationship she later developed in her novel, The Professor. She eventually took over a teaching position at the Belgian school, working closely, closely with Hager. Um, she, however, never succeeded at opening a school in Haworth. They advertised and got only one response from a pupil who ended up being unable to come. So um, her time as a migrant didn't pay off economically. But since no daughters outlived their father, that economic nightmare of having to support themselves never materialized. Charlotte's journey might be seen as fruitless if it weren't so generative for her fiction. Bronte left England a staunch Protestant and encountered a deeply Catholic culture in Brussels, causing clearly documented internal conflict and some external strife with her hosts. Often critics have read Vallette as simply anti-Catholic. But there's ample evidence to suggest that Bronte was struggling with cultural adjustment and working successfully toward reconciliation of that cross-cultural encounter. Lucy Snow's character makes clear that though Bronte may have left home for economic reasons, she brought back with her a more nuanced and deeper understanding of Christianity from her years in Brussels. That nuance appears most convincingly in Lucy's relationship with another teacher, the Belgian Catholic, Monsieur Paul Emmanuel. Bronte's dialogue between these two takes turns that might surprise her Protestant readership. Late in the novel, in a chapter she called The Apple of Discord, in fact, she offers her readers a conversation between the beleaguered but still stubborn Lucy and her former nemesis, the Franco-Catholic Paul, whom she's growing to love. From the beginning of their conversation about faith in this chapter, Lucy summarizes her Protestant creed. She tells Paul, I would not trouble your faith. You believe in God and Christ and the Bible, and so do I. After that summary, the novel gives reader, the reader Paul's direct response. But do you believe in the Bible, Lucy? Do you receive revelation? Perhaps surprising to any Protestant reader attending to this initial question, Paul does not ask Lucy about her lack of concern for the guiding tradition of the church, or even about her faith in God and Christ. Instead, his initial and genuine concern is for the value she places on scripture. While he may not voice the Reformation rallying cry of sola scriptura, Bronte's crafting of Paul's concern reveals these two believers' common ground as more pressing than the doctrines that divide them. The ongoing dialogue reminds readers of both the trials and the frustrations along the path to true understanding and sympathy among people of different traditions. Yet Bronte also suggests to her readers that by talking, quote, seriously and closely, as she describes their conversations, as Paul and Lucy do over a series of conversations, each believer might come to some conclusions that while the other's tradition was not quite the one cultivated in one's own church, it had its own, as the novel says, perhaps deeper power, its own more solemn awe. Bronte fictionally undoes Victorian stereotypes about Catholics, drawn from post-potato famine Irish migration and from the restoration of the Catholic hierarchy in England in the 1850s. In her novel, the loveless, poverty-stricken Lucy is the immigrant in La Vascour, an educated Englishwoman speaking with an equally educated Belgian man even if she does call him the foreigner. <laughs> Both parties also experience the frustration, the fear, the vexation um, of the unknown, and skepticism at various turns that one might expect after authentic encounters with difference. Yet through these imperfect gestures, Paul and Lucy come to appreciate that difference must be understood more complexly than allowed for by any dichotomy of those who are for us and those who are against us, or those who are from here and those who are not. The difference is spiritually troubling, yet both are led to ask what is in the other's best interest. 
Through their respect for brothers and sisters in the family of God, rather than trust only in national interest, both also experience a deeper reverence for the mystery of God. Finally, with confidence in their own creeds and with deep faith in a God who works in ways difficult for God's children to understand, Bronte shows Lucy and Paul each loving God more fully through the image of a God they come to see in each other. One character, an English traveler to a foreign land, and the other a representative of what some readers um, would have seen as a foreign aggressor in England. George Eliot drew more loosely on her own travels for her fiction than did either Bronte or Barrett Browning. Um, the impact on Eliot's life of the time she spent in Germany, though, may be most immediately dramatic on her career. Because of complications of Victorian marriage law, and I can talk more about Eliot's biography if you want me to when we're done, um, Eliot was not able to marry her companion of 30 years, a man named George Henry Lewes. And she and Lewes decided initially that it would diminish the scandal of their relationship for her if they began their life together on the continent. So for eight months, from 1854 to 1855, Eliot joined the man she would insist was her husband, mainly in Weimar and in Berlin. Though Eliot was already known in London literary circles as a translator and an essay writer, she didn't imagine herself writing fiction until the later months of their stay in Berlin. From that early imagination, she went on to write um, some of the best novels in English fiction. Her novel, Middlemarch, is repeatedly ranked as the best British novel as culturally critic, cultural critics go back and do that. The early days of that journey inspired the opening scenes of her final work, Daniel Deronda, which is the one that I'm going to focus on briefly tonight. It's true, though, that from her earliest novel, Eliot articulates the way gender inflects freedom to travel. In Adam B., though young Hetty Sorrell never makes it out of England, her pregnancy as a single woman pushes her away from home, wandering the countryside like a, quote, hunted, wounded beast. Meanwhile, her seducer, Arthur Donathorne, avoids the discomfort his scandalous relationship with Hetty causes by joining his regiment, traveling to Ireland, and becoming a military hero. Years later, in Eliot's final novel, Daniel Deronda, she represents a young woman living abroad as the beautiful, virtuous Jewish singer, Mira Lapidoff. Though Mira and the selfish Hetty share almost no other traits, their vulnerability as women away from home does link them. Mira first appears and unsettles the novel's heroine, Daniel, as he comes to suspect that she's on the banks of the River Thames to commit suicide. Committing suicide in the Thames was a common plight for seduced and abandoned women in the mid-19th century. As Mira fulfills, nearly fulfills Daniel's fears, he rescues her and hears a brief version of her story. Mira was expatriated from England by her father as a child, taken from her mother and brother, and made to live a migrant's life on the continent, working as a singer to support her father's gambling addiction. Throughout her young life, she continues as best she could to maintain the practices of her faith. Though the 1860s setting of Eliot's novel predates international laws on refugees, Mira would fit that description when we meet her. She's been driven to attempt suicide when she learns that the home she remembers in London has been destroyed and she's without any family to protect her. She's certain she'll never find her mother or brother again. She can't return to her father because he's preparing to sell her in marriage to a nobleman, again, to support his gambling. Mira tells Daniel, quote, I have nowhere to go, nobody belonging to me in all the land. Daniel helps Mira find a community immediately, taking her to the quiet home of his friend Hans Meyrick, where Hans's mother and sisters welcome Mira gently, as if she had been a lost member of their family. As often happens in novels, Daniel and Mira, Daniel and Mira begin to fall in love. Um, simultaneously, as sometimes happens in novels, Daniel discovers his own true identity when he finally meets his birth mother, who tells him that he is Jewish. Mira then joins Daniel in his plans to travel to Palestine and restore a community of faith for Jewish people there. Though not quite as conflict-ridden as it is today, in the late 19th century, Zionism was already a complex political plan, and Eliot treats it carefully. Importantly for her, Daniel imagines a community of faith outside of a nation-state model. His guardian continues to insist that Daniel has political plans, and Daniel continues to correct him to say that he wants to build a community for his people. Those ideas for community might be said to begin on the banks of the Thames when he rescues Mira. There's much more to say about that conversation, but one exchange will give a sense of the importance for the novel. Daniel's immediately confused about Mira's identity. She speaks English too well to be a foreigner, but she does not seem to belong in England. She answers him by reframing her own selfhood. Quote, I am English born, but I am a Jewess. Eliot, in other words, has Mira's 
has Mira respond in a way that avoids national identity in favor of identity in a faith community? Elliot then takes that initial reframing of Mira's and has it drive the rest of her plot. Daniel becomes a scholar of Judaism, discovering a sense of himself and finding a purpose rooted in communal laws of faith. As these two writers and travelers remind us, it was possible to imagine national concerns about economics and security differently than W.R. Gregg did. In the face of unprecedented global movement that we feel like we're seeing today, their imaginative reframing of relationships between migrants and locals also reminds us of a need to look past our tendency to frame situations through our cultural privileges, whether those privileges be based on gender, class, nationality, or religion, or simply being located in the place that other people want to be. We do well to examine our unarticulated anxieties about different ethnicities and to try to imagine how we might thrive more fully in community with those who are not like us and therefore have strengths and fresh perspectives to offer us. All three writers remind us that we do even better if we imagine defining our we by our faith identity first and our national one later. Scripture gives us several useful terms for reframing our understanding of travelers from abroad. And this would be one place where my slides would have been helpful. I had several scripture references there, but I can give them to you um, if you need them. Exile, sojourner, and even when scripture uses alien, which it often does, that alien is never legal or illegal. More often, that person is an invitation to meet Christ. The passages on those travelers remind us um, those of us with a more secure earthly home of how we ought to respond to foreigners. If we look as Jesus does, the expatriate is no more to be envied than the refugee or the migrant. If we remember that scriptural charge of those who have been given much, those of us who have enjoyed the cultural privilege of traveling outside our home countries might remember more what it means to remember the least of these and to work for those whose travel is only driven by necessity. Thank you.